What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of PNEX, RX Bar, Atari, Einstein Bagels, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. You know, my favorite parts of the interviews aren't necessarily when someone like Noah Alper from Einstein Bagels describes how he built and sold his chain of bagel stores for $100 million, but Ryan, what I love is when he talks about selling religious tchotchkes out of his trunk and several businesses that didn't work out. And how he pivoted. And we'll, we're going to get into this because you are uniquely qualified to talk about this. And you know, you're going to walk us through how you can actually avoid the fatal mistake of choosing the wrong business. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But first, I want to talk to you about uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And Rise25's mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. That's what we love to do. That's what we do day in, day out. We do it in three ways. We have a done for you media, which we help your company completely run and launch your own podcast. We distribute it across whatever it is, 11 different channels, including a dedicated blog post, social media. You show up and talk. We do everything else. Our team has been working with podcasters since 2009. I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. Besides connecting with great people like Ryan, founders of and CEOs of P90X, Atari, Mattel, um, I've made best friends. I found my business partner. It's led to tons of relationships and countless customers and referral partners. Um, the second is a done for you lead generation. We manually send a consistent flow of customized outreach messages to your ideal clients or referral sources. And this is not paid traffic, by the way. We are not traffic experts at all. And we do done for you VIP events um, live and in person with in conjunction with conferences or software companies we help you bring your highest level customers uh in a room and to network and connect and collaborate so i am excited uh it's been four years ago uh today we have ryan levac and ryan is the inc 500 ceo of the ask method company and the number one national best-selling author of ask which was named by Inc. as the number one marketing book of the year. And his work has been featured on the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Forbes, Entrepreneur, and over 250,000 entrepreneurs subscribe to his email newsletter. That's a lot of football stadiums. I mean, multiple (laughs) times over. Um, He is a co-founder investor in Bucket.io, a leading marketing funnel software for entrepreneurs. And his latest book, Choose, helps readers avoid making the single biggest mistake when starting a business. You know, and I would, Noah probably wishes, Noah Alper from Einstein Bagels probably wishes he had this book at the time. Um, but what the book does is it guides you through answering the most important question, which is what type of business should you start? Or if you've chosen a path, you should maybe stop pursuing it. Okay. And so I want to mention you can go to, I've been hounding his team because I want the audio version. And so go to choose the book.com slash insider. And you get a free book and all you have to do is pay for shipping. I mean, just it's worth its weight in gold right there. Yep. $7 for shipping. And they have several bonuses for you, which I would just buy the book just for the bonus. Full, full price. You don't even have to charge me seven, you know, free shipping or a uh, free book and plus shipping. But the uh, includes the audio book, which I've been hounding them for. It includes tw- top 25 lucrative niches. For 2019 and beyond, but you know, which we'll talk about. You know, he t- only talks about evergreen things, um, so it will be good for till 2000. You know, 30 uh, and launch your business mindset. Many more. Ryan, I'll stop talking. Thank you for joining me, Jeremy. It's awesome to be back, man. I can't believe how long it's been. I know it's crazy. Uh, you look the same. I've lost a lot of hair, so. Um, well, I've, I've actually grown the beard. That's the, that's the one thing. That's, takes although that will be coming off soon. My mom talked to me on FaceTime the other day. It was my son's birthday. And uh, she only talked, I don't know if your mom does this. My mom speaks to me in French when she is uh, upset with me. And she speaks to me in French. She said, well, she's French Canadian, right? She says, uh, uh, I do not like the beard. It has to go. Really? And that's when I knew. All right. Yeah. Well, um, it only, go, it only so. matters what the wife says, not the mom. You know oh, I mean? totally. I oh, I know. I I, I totally Mom, know. Whatever. Um, if your wife said that, it's it's going to be gone the next day. But 
<laughs> exactly. It's so true. So true. Good. Um, it's good to be back, man. I wanted to talk about, you know, we'll talk about shoes. And, but I do want to talk about, um, you know, the book Choose is obviously highly recommended. Everyone should get it. Uh, but I want to talk about Ask. Ask, you know, yep. precedes it. And since it preceded, I want to discuss two of my favorite parts of Ask, and then we can talk about Choose. But one of my favorite parts of Ask, and I, I you know, kind of want to bring people up to speed. If you haven't gotten Ask, get it. Um, but my, one of my, my favorite part of Ask is when you talk about depth over frequency. And you, you talk about specifically in the Orchid niche. And I think... I was listening to this last night, you talk about this, and I just thought it was too important not to talk about. And what did you discover with depth versus frequency? Yeah, you know, so for anyone not familiar, ask uh, the book and the methodology that the book teaches is a marketing methodology to figure out exactly what your customers want. So you know what market you want to go into, you know what business you want to start. Now you've got to figure out what to create, what to sell, um, and also what messaging to use and how to describe your products and services. And so how do you understand your market at such a deep emotional level that you can communicate with them in such a way that they say, oh my gosh, it feels like you can, uh, you know, you know what I'm going through and you can describe it better than I can describe it myself. Well, the way it all starts is with doing what's called a deep dive survey. And this deep dive survey consists of asking a very specific set of questions, some of which are open ended, meaning you're letting people fill in the blank and, and pour their heart out to you. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why you do that is you want people to you want to give people the opportunity to tell you as much or as little as they'd like. Right. So um, a question that you can ask people is when it comes to X, X being the thing you help people with in their business when it comes to orchid care or caring for your orchids, what's your biggest challenge that you're struggling with right now? Please be as detailed and specific as possible. Now, a mistake that people make when they're at this stage, it's it's not rocket science to, 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 to get this concept that you ask people what they want so you can give it to them, but the mistake that people make is they focus on what I call the myth of the FAQ. They spend a lot of time focusing on the things that they hear most often. When in reality, instead of focusing on frequency of response, you actually want to focus on depth of response. Mm. What that means is you want to isolate the 80-20, the top 20% of your market, who gives you the longest, most detailed, most passionate answers. And everything you create, everything you sell, everything you write about, everything you blog about should be 100% focused on that hyper-responsive segment of your market. That is the secret. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Thank you for clarifying that because um, when I was listening to you, it, you know, we often go, oh, this keeps coming over and over. I better talk about that or form a product around that or a course around that. But it's really – that may not be the huge pain point passionate part of the audience. Um, my second part, second favorite part of the book is – and this is kind of – I get torn inside internally a little bit with this because – and you'll see why. When we talk about asking the customer and then someone in response goes – you know, they talk about Steve Jobs or Henry yeah. Ford and what they said. So I want you to just clear up how people can move forward, even though it seems like contradictory advice. Yeah. You know, whenever I bring up this idea of asking people what they want so you can give it to them, inevitably someone brings up one of the quotes you just mentioned. So there's the, the, the quote that's attributed to Henry Ford, which says, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have told me a faster, faster horse. Yeah. Uh, and Steve Jobs is famous for saying, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And the reason why those statements ring true is because they are true. People don't know what they want. In fact, if I said, Jeremy, I want you to imagine, what would you, if you could create your dream car, right? What would you want to have in that car? What would, just tell me. You're accessing a part of your brain that's speculating, thinking, well, maybe I would like this. I think I would like this, but we don't know. We can, we can guess, but we don't know. If instead I ask you a different type of question and I say, Jeremy, tell me one thing about the car you drive right now that is annoying. One thing about the car right now that bugs you. You're now accessing a different part of your brain where you're looking into the past. You're looking at things that you've experienced. And you may have experienced, if, you've, if anyone, if you're listening to this right now and you've ever hired anyone for anything, whether it's a job at your house, um, a home contractor, a virtual assistant, an employee, whatever, we all hire thinking we know what we want. And then most of us have some experience that it doesn't work out quite according to plan. And the next time we hire for that job, what do we do? We say, I want to make sure this person is not like him or not like her. 
in this specific way. So it's, uh, it, it goes back to the fact that we don't know what we want, but we do know what we don't want. So that's a clue in the type of questions that you want to ask your audience to understand what you should create. Yeah. My mind doesn't go to hiring. It goes to like old girlfriends or what or something like that. Like, you know, you're dating. Like, I definitely don't want someone who like yells at me all the time. That, that's not good. Totally. But, uh, um, yeah. So why did you come out with this book second? Right. Because yeah. you, you talk about how, you know, choose is the most important decision. It comes first. Right. And then it's like Star Wars trilogy. You came out with ask first and, and choose second. Why? Yeah. You know, so, so when, I, when I came out with ask, the intent was to share the process I used to be successful in 23 different niche markets. Crazy random niche markets, everything from teaching people how to make jewelry with Scrabble tiles and origami paper to caring for your orchids, to memory improvement, to selling high-end water filtration systems for your home, and everything in between. And I wanted to share the path that I used that had generated over $150 million in sales. And so um, after Ask was released, you mentioned it, it was a number one national bestseller. It sold hundreds of thousands of copies. A lot of people have had a lot of success. It's now become a fixture in a lot of companies' research process for figuring out what to sell and what to create. But for every letter and card I got in the mail from someone who said, this book has changed my life, I would get letters and cards in the mail from people who said, Ryan, I read the book cover to cover. I followed the exact same process and it didn't work. Hmm. What did I do? And it frustrated me. It, it actually, it hurt me, right? Because I felt like uh, I, I, I didn't know what, what the issue was. So I embarked on a basically three-year research project to better understand why people who had tried implementing Ask failed. And what I came, what I discovered, what it came down to was that there was something I left out of the book that has proven to be the single most important ingredient. And that's this. I didn't share how I chose those 23 markets in the first place. So I started looking back at all my successes, all my failures, and started analyzing why did I fail when I failed? Why mm. did I succeed? Succeeded. I then expanded that research to all of my clients, all of my customers, all mm. my students where I figured out, where I looked at what were the commonalities between the customers and clients and uh, students who succeeded and those who failed. And the single biggest thing that came up over and over and over again was making the biggest mistake when first starting mm. a business was choosing a bad market. Now, Jeremy, the analogy or the metaphor that I always like to use is like this. It's sort of like, you know, uh, having ask, um, uh, uh, you know, or methodology like ask, um, when you start your business, it's kind of like we start a business kind of like um, throwing a, a boat in the river, right? You know your business is going to get you to where you want to be in life. It's going to give you the freedom that you want. It's going to give you the financial uh, results that you want. It's going to give you the ability to make the impact that you want, all the things that you want. So you're going on this journey that's going to take you to a destination. And so what do you do? You get your boat. You throw it in the river. You get your raft. You throw it in the river. And uh, you get the best possible equipment. Um, some cases you might hire the most capable crew. Um, you might bust your butt and you know paddle 18 hours a day with all your energy. But here's the thing: if that boat is facing in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter how good your crew is, how good of a boat you have, or how hard you work. You're not going to get to your destination. Or worse yet, if you put your boat into a dry riverbed where there's no water at all, it doesn't matter how hard you paddle. You're not going to get there. Similarly, if you throw your, bo your boat in the middle of a vast ocean where you get swallowed up, you're not going to get there either. And so what I realized is that I failed to teach people how to find that secret hidden river, the river that is just the right size, that has the motion, the power to propel you forward in your business and in your life to get you to exactly where you want to go. Yeah. And that's what this book is all about. It's all about how to decide what river you're going to put your boat into so that way when you do paddle, you're making sure you're getting yourself in the right direction and you have that momentum at your back to get you to where you want to yeah. go. I've totally experienced that. I mean, there is, it's amazing. And, and putting into a framework is going to be, you know, once I listen to the full audio book, I've look, you know, read through the book. But um, I've totally experienced that. Like, what, I, this one immediately had momentum, this business. And this one, it was just pushing a boulder up a hill, you know. And maybe yeah. it's, you know, as an entrepreneur, you think, Maybe I'm not working hard enough. I need to work harder. Maybe it's just going to take, you know, we've always heard the inches from 
gold or diamonds or however the story goes. Maybe it's just that inch. And so, you know, when you experience the momentum, then you're looking back and go, what was I thinking before? You know, um, totally. We question ourselves, right? It raises self-doubt. We start thinking, maybe I didn't work hard enough. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe my judgment is 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 leading me uh, astray. What we realize in the three years of going through this research project is that there are common things. There are things that you absolutely want to have in your market, things you absolutely want to avoid. There are certain sweet spots that you want to be looking for in terms of your market size, in terms of the amount of competition. All of these things are things that you can set yourself up for success in advance before you put the hard blood, sweat, and tears into the business to know that, listen, you're putting your boat in a river that if you just paddle, if you put it in the right direction, you're going to get there. Yeah. And we'll talk about some of those mistakes and some of those um, things that you must have. Um, Ryan, from your research, three years of research, there was a lot of people you saw and a lot of niches that failed, that did not work. Um, is there one or two that stick out that you can talk about that, okay, if you're thinking about this, maybe just I've seen a bunch of people fail in this particular niche, avoid it. What are some failures yeah, yeah. You, you've seen? Yeah, well, I'll share a, a couple of mine that kind of led to some of the realizations that I that I share in the book and the observations. So you talked about the the market must haves, like the five five market must haves, five things that every market that I went into that ended up being a huge success had every single one of them. Everyone that was a failure or just a kind of a not a total failure, but just never really took off. It was because it was missing one of these key ingredients, and the same thing was true with all my students and clients. And uh, the first one. Um, is a, the, a mistake I made with my very first business. And uh, the very first business I went into um, was teaching people how to make jewelry with Scrabble tiles and origami paper. I think we may have even talked about it um, on, the, on the interview a few years ago. And uh, it was a market I went into because my wife uh, was, uh, came across this website, it's like 2007, 2008, called Etsy.com, which is a huge website now. It was like a tiny little website back then. Mm. And there was this jewelry that everybody was selling. It was like everywhere. And it was make, it, it, you'd take a Scrabble tile, you'd put some origami paper on it, You'd affix a bale and a pendant on it, put some resin on it, and it looked like this kind of beautiful jewel almost um, with simple ingredients. And it was everywhere. It was crazy. And so um, we knew we didn't want to uh, make the jewelry itself, but we found someone on the website who was teaching people how to make the jewelry. She had a tutorial. Um, and she was selling something like 20 or 30 copies of this tutorial every single day at like $20 a pop. We did the math real quick. And we're saying, gosh, she's making like $10,000, $15,000 a month selling this PDF from her house right. with no overhead. And so we're like, all right, we gotta do this. So we, we and it wasn't, and it wasn't very good. Like the tutorial wasn't very good. It was just like on homemade Microsoft Word, just like, you know, all sorts of problems with it. So we built a better mousetrap. Long story short, we took that business, started making $1,000 a month, $2,000, $5,000, $8,000, almost $9,000, $10,000 a month. We thought, hey, this is easy, right? This is great. And uh, before we knew it, the market had totally disappeared. Mm. It became saturated. It, what happened, Jeremy, was that every, literally everyone on Etsy started selling the jewelry. There was nobody left to buy it. Like everyone was just selling it. It became like a huge seller's market. And when everyone started selling it, no one's buying it. Nobody bought the, the, the tutorials on how to make it. And so I learned from this business the lesson that you want to avoid going into fad or trending markets. And so a more recent example of this at a much grander scale that uh, we've seen happen just right before our eyes uh, was the Bitcoin market, yeah. right? There, there, was a, there was a period of time where you could not log into Facebook, not turn on Instagram, not go to uh, YouTube, not uh, turn the corner without someone talking about Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. And if you look at the, the Google Trends data, which is a tool, free tool you can use to look at keyword volume online, you'll see that the volume, the keyword volume just goes up, 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 up. And then when the Bitcoin crash happened, the keyword volume, the amount of searches online for people looking for Bitcoin information fell off a cliff as well. And so uh, there are these markets. Bitcoin oh, I know. To I know people who totally experienced that viscerally. They had a, a Bitcoin crypto conference and it was huge. And then the next one they went to release crickets. No one showed up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you want to so you want to watch out for markets like that. We've seen it at fidget spinners. I was just uh, I just Bitcoin. wrote that down when you said that fidget spinner yeah, uh, for the e-commerce totally. 
Pokemon Go, right? Um, there's a story I tell in, you know, the type of business you want to avoid is, um, we, you're going to laugh at when I say it now, but it wasn't so obvious a few years ago, going into um, like iPhone 4S tips. When the iPhone 4S came out, it was the best selling iPhone of all time, right? Huge. It was like going crazy. You look at it now and it is barely a blip in terms of the keyword volume. So you want to be looking for markets that are evergreen. So, so I learned this lesson. Second market I went into after really experiencing this. So, so what happened with the Scrabble tile business is went up, 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 fell off a cliff. At this point, I'd quit my job to do this full time. No pressure. My right? wife was yeah. a, a grad student, so she was still a grad student, basically not really making any money. And we had burned through our savings, and we looked at each other and had our moment where we're like, what do we do next? Crap. Like, what do we do next? And so she went back. She got a job, paid $36,000 a year as a museum curator, which is what she went to school for. Um, and I focused on our next business full time. And I said, I'm not going to make that same mistake. I'm going to go after something that is an evergreen market, which is the first market must have, uh, an evergreen market. And so I looked at uh, what was the longest uh, oldest hobby in America. And um, I learned this uh, when I did the research that the oldest, longest hobby in America um, is gardening. Something like over 200 million Americans garden. I couldn't believe it, wow. right? It's like such a crazy number. No idea. Um, yeah. and, and gardening has been one of these things that's been around for 100 years, more. And it's probably going to be around in some way, shape, or form for the next 100 years. Now, I knew gardening was too big of a market to go into. So I started looking at different sub-niches and micro-niches within the gardening space. And I came across one that showed promise, um, uh, which was the orchid care market. So teaching people how to care for orchids as in the flowers. Uh, orchids have been around since the time of the dinosaurs. There's something like 80,000 orchid species around the world. Um, people have been, you can see Renaissance paintings with orchids in them. People have been caring for orchids for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so it gave me the confidence to know that if this was something that is happening now, it's probably going to be something that's going to be around for 10, 15, 20 years from now. Long story short, took that business from nothing to $25,000 a month in mm -hmm. 18 months. Eventually grew it to half a million dollars a year. And here we are, Jeremy, 10 years later, and that business still makes half a million dollars wow. a year, 10 years after That's creating. That's crazy. Metronome, year after year after year. Why? Because it's an evergreen market. Amazing. Um, and we'll get into some of those, those must-haves and everything like that. But I have to say, you know, when I was reading through the book, um, one of the most impressive parts of the book was, was before it started, actually. Um, you have some of the top entrepreneurs and marketing minds. You know, usually people have some forwards and people say kind words and there's a one or two. Yours is like four pages long of some of the top marketing minds on the planet. So you have like Kevin Harrington, Vern Harnish, Michael Hyatt, Michael Masterson, Ryan Dice, Perry Marshall, Jay Abraham, the one and only Brian Kurtz. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about the influence on a few of those people, on you and the book. Yeah. You know, yeah, talk about sure. all of them, but I mean, there's many more I didn't even mention that are there in the book. But um, who are so some of the influential things. ones for you? Yeah, so some of the a couple of the names that you um, that you just mentioned right there. So um, you mentioned Jay Abraham. So Jay Abraham is someone that I, I've studied his work for uh, you know for years, for for you know more than a decade. I'd say almost two decades, right? Studying his work, um, and he's someone who's become uh, he's become a mentor. He's become a friend. Uh, he's become a colleague. And one of the things I learned from him is just this strategy of preeminence, right? And what he describes for anyone who's not familiar with it, strategy of preeminence is basically um, a way of life where if you just walk into every relationship, every situation, and just give 100% of yourself, just put it all out there, you never know what's going to happen with that. Nothing might happen. Amazing things might happen or something in between. But if you just constantly live life like that, just put it all out that, put it all out there, deliver a ton of value up front with no expectation in return, good things happen. And, you know, what's sort of meta about your kind of uh, the question right here is, you know, how did, you know, you know, Brendan Bruchard, I'm just looking at the book right now, Brendan Bruchard, Michael Hyatt, Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank, uh, Hal Elrod, number one bestselling author, Jeff Walker, New York Times bestselling author, Dory Clark, um, Duke University School of Business, um, you know, the list goes on. Why did those people feel compelled to, um, uh, uh, you know, provide a, a, an endorsement for the book? Well, in many cases, it's because that there's something that happened along the way where there was an opportunity to just provide value to them in their life in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, you know, when, when the ask came, when I said, hey, I'm, you know, would you be open to doing an endorsement or at least share a few kind words about the book if you like it, you know, every single time was, mm. yeah, 
I'm in 100%. They went from like one page to two pages to five pages. Of- <laughs> I love reading them though. I really do. Yeah, you know, and that's not even all. We had to we had to cut it there. You know, the truth is we had to we couldn't even include um, every single every single one. Um, but the, but the point is this, you know, when you try to deliver as much value, like that's my only move. Like if I say there's one meta move I have in life, like that's my one move. It's just like walk into a room, deliver value with no expectation in return, and then you'll have some people that'll take that and they'll walk away with it, and it'll never come back to you, like ever, right? And then you have other people you do that and they will become lifelong friends. That's how I've met my uh, best friends in the world. That's how I've developed my, my that's how I met my business partner. Um, that's how I've met uh, uh, promotional partners, uh, uh, clients. It's so simple. It's hard, but it's so simple. Mm-hmm. Just deliver all that value, strategy, preeminence. Uh, read Jay Abraham's work because that's where the idea, at least where I first learned that concept and that idea. Um, and, um, and yeah. yeah. I mean, again, um, what I also see in the book, it's it's a huge labor. It's a huge amount of work to put out a book like this. It may I don't know, from the outside maybe it seems simple to people and maybe oh choose, it's just a one word title. You probably spent I don't know how many hours you spend thinking about what to call this book. <laughs> Never mind the subtitle. The subtitle right. we obsessed over the subtitle actually had one word different. Um, maybe what we'll do is this. Um, I'll reveal what the one word difference was to the subtitle mm. literally up until a week before it was due. So we had a subtitle that we obsessed over and it was right. this. And one day I woke up one night and I said, this is the wrong word. Mm. We're going to change this one word. We'll reveal it maybe at the end of the episode. Okay. <laughs> How's that for? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're a copywriter at heart, right? And so, <laughs> so what were other working titles besides choose? You know, um, so so what's interesting about this whole process is one of the things I've learned when it comes to writing a book. I made a ton of mistakes in my first book. Like I had no idea what I was doing. Your first time author made every mistake in the book. Um, like what? You know, no one would anyone, know. No one would ever know. What's that? No one no, would ever but, you know. know but there's some there are some valid criticisms about the book. Like for example, and I'll just call you know the two biggest criticisms about the my first book, Ask. And by the way, we're going to be releasing a, 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 a an Ask 2.0 version. Cool. Um, that's that's what's coming next. Um, cause there's so many updates that have, you know, changed the way the internet's changed, the world's changed and everything like that. Um, but, uh, the two biggest mistakes I made, number one was, uh, people rightfully, uh, complain that there are too many upsells in the book. So too many mentions of, you know, you can buy this product, you can do this thing. So that was like the first mistake. Second mistake that people just didn't like. Why is that a mistake people. though? Well, well I, mean, I mean, I think it's, a, it's it, it, I I think it's a, it's a matter of like, de- what if I like, for, let me give you an example, like for your book. This book, Choose, I actually want the up, I want the audio version, right? I mean, so some people may complain about that and others won't. So how do you know, how do you determine that's a mistake, you know? Well, I mean, you think, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, this is ask 101, right? It's like for people who buy your products, you ask them, what did you like about it? What's missing? What could we do different? And so for like in us in our company, every time we put something out, whether it's running an event, creating a new product, we always get feedback on it. What did you like? What can we do different? How can we improve? Mm-hmm. And so that that is like it's in the DNA of our company. It's in my DNA. The challenge with writing a book is once the book's printed and 100,000 copies are floating around, right. it's too late, dude. <laughs> it, it's, you can't say, all right, just kidding. Bring your copy back and I'll exchange it for right. uh, another one. It's out there. So. Um, so the two big mistakes was uh, too many upsells and then separating the story and the methodology. So ask first half of the book is like a personal story of how the methodology came about. Second half was really the technical kind of nerdy methodology nuts and itself. Bolts. Yeah, nuts and bolts. And so some people love that, but a lot of people just you know they said ah, you know the first hundred pages or fifty pages of the book it's it's you, you know just a waste of time. I want to get to the meat. Mm. Some people came up to me and said, I love the first half. Like, forget the second half. Your story has inspired me and blah, blah, blah. So anyways, t- taking that feedback, we incorporated that feedback into um, into this book. Um, we also did things differently. I taught this methodology that is in this book for a year and a half before we wrote mm-hmm. this book. So we brought people through this training, through the framework, every single step of the way. What makes sense? Where are you confused? What doesn't work? Okay, let's shift. Let's make mm-hmm. a pivot. Another group of people, next cohort, take them through the same thing until we refined it to a place that we were incredibly confident that we could put it in the pages of a book that will, you know, live uh, forever. Yeah. 
So I say that, and you asked the question originally, how did we come up with the title? The way we came up with the title was a year and a half of testing around what title resonated with people the most, which um, spoke to them the most, and really covered the um, um, you know the key uh, points of the book. I love it. Yeah, because you're like, oh, you didn't throw a dart, and you're like, ah, oh, choose. Or looking at it, it lo- seems like an obvious choice. It's sim- simplicity on yeah. the far side of complexity. I mean, that's the right. whole book is that. It's, it's you know, um, and I, I feel like that's a bit of a hallmark to ask. It's a bit of a hallmark to choose as well. It is, okay, well, you know, choose a good market. So simple, right? Just choose a good market and sell in that market. Awesome. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you know that you're setting yourself up for success out of the gate? How do you know that? Well, it's a, it's a big question. And um, yeah, we tried to tackle that in this book. So the other part I, I always love to read in books is the thank you, the thank yous, okay? Um, and you mentioned someone in here, and I want you to talk about how this person helped shape the book in some feedback. Uh, Michelle Thousand, mm-hmm. you said something like you've spent 100 hour days or whatever, you know, weeks um, <laughs> helping with this. Um, what did they do? What, what did they, how did they help shape the book and what was their feedback? So what's interesting about books, if you've, if you've ever embarked on a, on a book like this, um, it's, it's unfair that only one name can be, uh, one author's name could be on the title of the book. Because the reality is, is there's an entire village of people who helped make this book happen. Um, and I worked with multiple writers, multiple editors, uh, members of my team. Um, so Michelle is a, is a member of my team, and she is our director of content. And she and I are very much foils to one another. So a lot of the things that we've built and created in our business, we are uh, creative foils. So I've learned that the creative process is rarely, at least in my experience, it's rarely a single human being sitting in a room by themselves having a eureka moment. For me, in many cases, it's workshop sessions, it's conversations, it's putting stuff up on the whiteboard and on flip charts and scribbling things out and having the team there and bouncing ideas off one another. And that's where the breakthroughs come. It comes from that experience. And so Michelle, in many ways, was my foil in creating this book working with her to come up with the concepts, come up with the frameworks, test those frameworks with our with our students, with our audience, um, putting those frameworks into words on paper, refining it, kind of obsessing over every single word, every single nuance. Um, and um, uh, from, a, from an Enneagrammatic st- standpoint, so if you're familiar with the Enneagram, um, I, I'm a three on the Enneagram, which is the achiever. So very much, you know, goal driven, um, wanting to achieve certain, you know, uh, milestones. Michelle is a one, which is the perfectionist. Mm-hmm. Um, three one is a very powerful creative dynamic because the three wants to make it happen, wants to get it out there. And the one ensures that it's mm-hmm. done the right way. It, so three one combinations are very is powerful. Is it similar to like a visionary integrator? Is that... I can see the visionary being that achiever and the integrator being, I don't know, perfectionist, but there's some, some parallels there. Yeah. So my, my business partner, uh, Richard, in, in our business, uh, I'm a three. He's a two. Mm. So the two in the Enneagram is the helper. So the two is mm. very much to help other people and always find a way, what can I do to support you? How, and and he's an, it, that makes an incredible integrator because the integrator's role is to support the entire team, right? So what resources do you need? How can I help you? Awesome. How can I help you? Um, the one is um, a little bit more toward doing things the right way. Um, so without getting into a deep conversation yeah. with the Enneagram, for anyone who's familiar, if anyone wants to learn more about the Enneagram, um, I recommend Ian Cron's work. Mm-hmm. He wrote a book called um, The Road Back to You. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he is a, he, Ian's become a good friend. Um, Ian's someone I've learned a ton from, and uh, he's someone whose work I totally recommend. Yeah, so I want to go come back to Michelle for a second, um, but on to Richard, because I know, at what point did you realize you needed an integrator type? Because I know you've listened or you, uh, I don't know, the methodology of rocket fuel, et cetera. At what point do you like, I need an integrator? Yeah, you know, it was when I... I at the point, you know, we just, uh, uh, in our business, so, you know, started the business a little over 10 years ago. My initial goal was to make $10,000 a month. Like, that was my big goal. I was like, if I could make $10,000 a month in passive income, I would never, like, who would ever want to work another day of your life? Like, that's great. You could travel and do everything, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
ten thousand dollars a month, you know, doesn't go as far as you might think it might with two guys. kids. I mean, college, yeah, totally. yeah, exactly. College bills, everything like that. But when I was, it was just me and my wife. That was my big goal. Ten years later, we just celebrated our tenth year in business, um, doing ten million dollars a year. Just passed ten million dollars a year across all the things we're doing. Um, landed on the Inc. 500 list, fastest growing companies in America, and it was probably around. I don't recall the exact revenue level, but we were probably around. I want to say between maybe around three million dollars a year. And don't quote. I, and I don't want to. You know, I don't want this to be like this is off the record. I don't remember the exact revenue right. moment, but it was in that range where I realized, I think I've taken this thing as far as I can by myself. Hmm. Like I realized that I was trying to, you know, I'm the, I'm the creative guy. I am the head of marketing. I'm the face of our business. So in many ways, I'm the, you know, part of the product, right? We do a lot of teaching and training in our sure. business, so I'm part of the product. And now I'm trying to also run a team. Um, I can't do it all myself. And truthfully, I am not skilled enough hmm. to. You may not even life. enjoy it. I mean, he, probably being the integrator, he maybe enjoys that stuff too. Totally. And so um, I, the way Rich, everyone wants to know, how did we meet? Um, Richard was actually a client of mine. So um, I was helping him grow his business using the ask method. Um, he was part of my highest level uh, business coaching group. And um, he was asking for my help uh, to, to help him grow his business. I helped him launch two businesses using the ask method, both of which uh, went on to make uh, uh, multiple millions of dollars a year. And I literally sat down with him one day and I said, um, I need some advice. And I said, uh, and I knew what his superpower was. His superpower wasn't um, mine. It was very uh, much building teams and systems and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to him and I said, um, I need a Richard. Mm. And he said, only one of me. <laughs> that um, led us to um, decide to, to work together and grow, you know, grow this business and to, to what it's become and where we're going to be taking it. Yeah. So. Back to Michelle. Thanks for sharing that because I think it's an important point. You know, at a certain level, all of us need something that we don't have in, in realizing where we need to fill those gaps. Um, what did you and Michelle disagree about? Hmm. And then I know ultimately who wins, which is the customer. But like, what did you disagree about? And then what happened? Because I imagine a lot, you both are probably passionate about the content that's being put out in this book. And I'm sure there's times where, like, I think this short story should be there or this concept, and then she's like, this story or this concept. Anything stick out no. as far as you guys kind of not butting heads, but just um, in a healthy way? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm thinking. You, you see me looking off into the distance because I'm thinking about some specific examples, and 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 generally the way that we, and one of the reasons why we work so well together is because. Um, oftentimes I'll have, I'm very good at the beginning and the end. What I mean by that, I'm very good at, here's the idea. We do this. Let's start with this. And I'm very good at tying it up at the end and looking at it and saying, this is not quite right. Let's make these final tweaks. But the middle of taking like this big picture concept and then carrying it through all the way is, is one of my, uh, where I'm not as strong as Michelle is. And so we know that about one another. And so oftentimes it's less of a disagreement, but more of, okay, um, this is the thing. And then Michelle, I'm going to let you take this and carry it through to the end. I'll come in at the end on this concept, on this idea, this framework, this thing that we want to teach. Ah, that's not quite right. And, uh, and make some tweaks. Uh, there are a handful of places. I'm trying to recall a specific example to bring it to life of one or two places where, you know, Michelle maybe was so passionate about something and I recognized that passion and it made me maybe rethink, um, you know, my view on it and, and say, OK, you know what? Um, we're going to go with what with what you think. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's um, it's um, in uh, certain judgments around how things will be perceived. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, there may have been a few stories that come to mind. So in the book, in addition to uh, the methodology, there are a number of stories of students who have used this methodology to launch successful businesses. And I wanted to pull in a wide variety of of students coming from all different backgrounds and, and all situations. And there may have been a few stories that um, uh, just may have been perceived in a way like the, the, the market that they were in or something about their personal background may have um, just been, um, you know, perceived in a way Maybe that create a bias or something. Exactly. Create a bias or um, 
you know, would 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 make people dismiss the methodology because of of who they were. The example I'm about to give is not a real example, but um, just to like to bring it to life. So we're not talking theory here. You know, imagine, for example, if if originally one of our stories is someone who um, created a um, a brand of a new brand of tequila using this, you know, this methodology. Well, there are going to be some readers who maybe whose families were affected by um, alcoholism and right. you know, maybe there's were, some uh, like stigmas drunk. to it yeah yeah exactly a drunk driving so that 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 didn't happen it wasn't it wasn't that specifically yeah. um or even yeah. that extreme but i'm just using they'll it judge them they'll judge the market instead of listening to the methodology type of thing exactly they'll yeah. say oh i'm gonna dis- i'm gonna dismiss like everything. maybe it's like a cannabis someone like started a you know a cannabis company or something and totally yeah, yeah. they'll dismiss the whole thing because they disagree with the, the moral aspect of someone's business so there are yeah. a few blind spots that not that specifically but yeah. blind spots like that that um, you know she felt very passionate about that helped uh, yeah. i think make this a better book so mistakes people make when choosing a market sure. um you talk yeah. about i think seven in the book um and you you could choose which one do you i mean i have a bunch listed here but which one you think would be most important to talk about first yeah well i think you know we started about the we started talking about the market must-haves and i think it's a good place mm-hmm. to to pick up where we left off on sure. that. So, that that there there what we discovered. So I was really inspired. I'm a big fan of Jim Collins' work. So Jim Collins, good to great, great by choice, um, studying iconic companies and what separated companies that have been you know the the pillars of the world economy and have sustained success over decades versus those that were successful for a season but then have fallen off into obscurity or just disappeared. What was it that separated those companies? And he's embarked in these very in depth research projects. And so I was inspired by that work to look at my own successful markets, my own failures, Mm. look at my students' successful markets, my students' failures, and try to uncover if there was any commonality. And what we found was that there are five things, five things that you absolutely wanna have in your market before deciding to start your business. Because what I found, what we found is that if any one of these things is missing, it is every single one of my failures had something missing in these five market must-haves. Every single one of my successes, ticked off all five of these boxes. So we talked about the first one already, which was the importance of an evergreen market, right? So versus a fad market. The second market must have is what we call an enthusiast market as opposed to a problem solution market. So a problem solution market is, an example is something like mold removal, right? Uh, Mold removal is like you've got mold in your house, you gotta hire a mold removal company, they come in, they remove the mold, you never wanna think about that ever again. Right, like you've moved on with your life, you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to think about it. You sure as heck are not signing up for any, you know, mold removal clubs, or uh, email newsletters, or Facebook groups. You're just like moving on with your life. Now contrast that with something like the dog market, right? For dog owners, we have a little dog. Um, I know how crazy dog owners are because I'm one of them. Um, dog owners, um, they buy something for their pet and they buy another thing for their pet and they buy another thing, right? You bring a puppy home and you've got to buy the crates and the the bowls and the food and the collar and then you've got to teach the dog how to, uh, to you got to potty train the puppy and then you got to teach the dog tricks and, and how to walk on a leash and all of these things. And then you've got pet insurance, um, you've got uh, doggy Christmas ornaments, doggy T-shirts, doggy everything, right? Um, and there are clubs for dog owners. There are online Facebook groups for dog owners. Uh, you know, so that's an example of an enthusiast market. And the key that you want to have is a market in which you can sell multiple things to the same customer. So you acquire a customer once, and you can sell to that customer over and over and over again. So that's the the second market must have is is an enthusiast market. Now, being in an evergreen and an enthusiast market in and of itself is not enough. There's a third market must have that you need, and that is solving an urgent problem in the context of that enthusiast market. So you can't just go into the dog market and say, you know what, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna sell doggy mugs, mugs with a picture of the dog on it. Why? Because you're not solving a burning. <laughs> problem in that market right. nobody wakes up and says like honey oh my gosh like you know stop everything we've got to get this mug and we got to get it right now instead you want to find what's a what's an urgent problem like in they're the peeing market. on your carpet yeah totally they're peeing on your carpet they won't stop barking they just bit the neighbor and you're thinking gosh they're going to make us put down the dog we got to solve this biting problem tomorrow the dog peeing on the rug thing crap we've got a trip 
We're taking the dog to see grandma and grandpa. We're about to hop on an airplane. How embarrassing is it going to be with the dog going to the mm-hmm. bathroom at the mm-hmm. airport on the plane? We can't be that family. Honey, we need to solve this tonight. Because here's the thing. When you solve that urgent problem for that customer, you can become the trusted advisor to that customer in that space for life. They can say, Jeremy, you have saved me. What should I do next? It's an incredible, pow- incredibly powerful position to be in. So urgent problem in the context of that enthusiast market. And that segues perfectly into number four, which is future problems. What I mean by that is this. You want a market where you can solve something for a customer and that success leads to a new problem that they didn't yet have. Perfect example of that is um, in the entrepreneur space, right? So if you teach so the space that, that, uh, that I operate in, right? So after you've chosen your market and you've decided what business you wanna start, what's the next step? Well, once you choose, you need to ask. You gotta figure out what people want. After you ask people what they want and you start to get success in selling that thing, you're making money, great. Now you're saying, crap, I'm doing all the work myself. How do I hire someone to help me? That's the next problem. So see how success can lead to another problem that didn't yet exist? You're looking for a market where there's the opportunity to solve future problems to someone after you've solved the previous one. And the fifth and final market must have is something that I learned from the late, great Gary Halbert, one of the, uh, you know, you mentioned copywriting earlier, one of my biggest copy uh, writing inspirations, largely regarded as one of the greatest direct response copywriters of all time, before he passed away, um, is a phrase called PWMs. You're looking for a market with PWMs, which stands for players with money. Hmm. So we talked about, so you, you asked me earlier about some of the mistakes, some of the markets that I had, um, that I failed in or had some um, you know, challenges or, or failures in. One of those markets was in the memory improvement space. So teaching people how to improve their memory. We have a business, um, it was moderately successful, but it wasn't a home run by any stretch of the imagination. And um, one of the reasons why, it's a business where we teach people how to improve your memory through memorization techniques. One of the biggest reasons why is the customers in that market, I learned this only after going into the business, is are predominantly and you might remember this in, in, in your life, uh, college students and grad students studying for standardized tests. Right. Studying for their MCATs, studying for their LSATs, studying for some the, the medical boards where they have to memorize huge amounts of information. That was our market. And if you can remember back when you were in grad school or when you were an undergrad, I don't know if you're like me, but I only Five had- $5 a- pizza Wednesdays, yeah, totally. Yeah, I only had a few hundred dollars <laughs> in my bank account. I didn't have money to go online and buy a two, three, four, five hundred dollar course uh, on how to improve uh, how to improve your memory. So um, we learned this the hard way that you want to focus on markets that have PWMs. Now the 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 corollary to that is a market like uh, the golf market. Golf market. Who are the buyers in that market? Typically men. Typically men in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. They've made a little bit of money at this time. They have a uh, uh, they're predisposed to spend a disproportionate amount of money in that area of their life. If you, if you know any golfers, you know that they spend a fortune on equipment, on clubs, on green fees. They do crazy things like golf vacations to Hawaii and the Caribbean. They do master's retreats where they spend tens of thousands of dollars. Golf cruises around the British Isles um, that you can spend $100,000 to be part of it. You're looking for markets where there is evidence of that level of spending. Yeah. Now, it's not necessarily that you're looking for people who are spending, um, you know, you're not looking for billionaires or multimillionaires. It's not that. You're looking for markets where people spend a disproportionate amount of money in that space. Um, and there are all sorts of markets like that. Um, the dog market is one of them. Um, home brewing is another great market. If you know any people who are uh, like brew their own beer. Very passionate. At, that, very passionate about, uh, uh, about that. Um, there are all sorts of markets like that where you're looking for uh, and you're looking for that evidence of PWMs. Any other evergreen? What would be another example of like evergreen markets? Yeah, uh, evergreen markets. Anything like guitar playing is a great one, right? People are playing guitar 100 years ago. Uh, people most likely are going to be playing guitar 100 years from now. Uh, things like uh, uh, fly fishing, um, things like painting, watercolors, things like that. Um, things like uh, photography. Photography will evolve. The equipment will evolve. But people are taking photos 100 years ago. They're going to take photos 100 years from now. You know, contrast that with something like fidget spinners, which is like, you know, it's in the media. It's hot. Every It's making magazine covers. It's uh, everyone's talking about it, which leads us to think that's where the opportunity is. But markets that typically rise quickly fall just as quickly. 
Another one that you want to avoid, typically most of the fad diets, right? Whatever the, the fad diet is of the day, they start to pick up, you know, Hollywood celebrities uh, follow the diets. You hear everybody talking about it and you look at them. You just watch them have this, this slow spiral of death that lasts some, sometimes weeks and months and sometimes even years. You know, so we look at like the Atkins diet. You look at things like the uh, South Beach diet. Those were the biggest diets of their day. They still exist today, but look at the Google Trends data on the keyword volume for those markets. You're going to see them kind of this slow death that's eventually going to go to nothing. Um, so you want to avoid being in markets that are on that downward trend. Yeah, yeah. Probably now I would imagine paleo is probably hitting its, its stride right now. Yeah, it was right now, right? That's the thing. Um, paleo and keto, those are, the, those are the ones that people are raving about. And who knows how long they'll last. They may last the next decade. They may, they may disappear in two years from now and something else replaces it. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. But what I do know is this. I know that if a market has been stable and has been uh, consistent for since Google Trends has been producing the data, which I believe, don't quote me on this, I think it's 2006, maybe 2004 that the data has been, that the data is available. Um, it, they released it in 2006. So we got 15 years of data. If you find a market that's basically been pretty stable for the last 15 years, good chance that for the next 5, 10, 15 years, it's also going to be stable. One of the things you do talk about in the book, and I think initially i've seen people make this mistake whereas they find this product or service and like there's no competition this is great what are your thoughts yeah, on so, that yeah two big mistakes we'll talk about so we'll talk about these so one of the biggest mistakes i see people make is um is uh, uh exactly what you just yeah. described that's, right? that's, that's when i start running the other way but <laughs> well there's, there's two sides to that coin right yeah. so um there's some people who who come up with an idea and they get really excited about the idea, and um, they um, they look online, they do some research, and they say, "Crap, someone else is already doing this." And then they throw the idea away and they move on to like their next thing. Other people uh, make the opposite mistake, which is they go online, they do a little bit of research, and they find that nobody's doing the thing, and they say, "Eureka! Like we've struck gold. How can there be nobody who's done this? This is amazing." And the reality is, listen, there are what, seven, eight billion people in this world. Chances are, if you have had the idea to do something, somebody else has already had the idea and tried it. And if you don't find evidence of that thing online, chances are it's because someone tried it and failed. Now, of course, there are ex exceptions to the rule. But if you look at the most right. successful companies of our era, if you look at Google, if you look at Facebook, if you look at Apple, one thing that you'll notice that they all have in common is that none of them were the first to enter their market. Google was not the first search engine. Facebook was not the first social media platform. Apple was not the first to sell smartphones or MP3 players. No, what they did is they found a market that was proven and they built a better mousetrap. So here's what you want to be looking for. This is the quote that one of my mentors shared with me that, um, that I'll share here. Pioneers get shot, settlers get rich. What that means is you do not want to be a pioneer with arrows on, in your back and your face in the mud. You want to be the settler who has leveraged the path that somebody else has already blazed, the trail that somebody else has already blazed, and you come in and you're building a better mousetrap. You're doing things a little bit differently from a different angle. And the key that you want to be looking for, Jeremy, is you want to look for a market where the competitors are succeeding in spite of themselves. That means is right. there's evidence that they're making money and yet they're making like three or four obvious mistakes or obvious things that they're just leaving money on the table. And you, you, you think to yourself, gosh, if they only did this, imagine how successful they'd be. That tells you that there's a soft underbelly to that market that you can come in and be successful in many cases right out of the gate. Yeah. Ryan, first of all, I want to thank you. Thank you for all the work uh, you've done. I mean, I continue to uh, read and apply the ask from when we talked about it, and I you know, listened to it multiple times years ago, and then I'm looking forward to listening to Choose, even though I've looked through the book. Um, I, wanna, I have one last question, which is about the subtitle. I'm not going to forget about that. And, um, but first, uh, people can go to choosethebook.com slash insider, get the, the book for free. You just pay shipping, and you get... All the bonuses we mentioned in the beginning, audio, the audio book, everything else. Um, and I want to mention, you should go back and listen to our previous interview 
Um, it was really powerful. And um, Ryan talked about the letter he wrote to his mom and the decision of he had to get out of the golden handcuffs. Um, mm. And it's not an easy decision to make and it's not easy to do. I visited LinkedIn a couple weeks ago and I'm like, if I had this trip, I don't think I'd ever leave. You know, like yeah. just whole cafeteria. I mean, it's just amazing perks. If I was there, I don't know if I'd leave. I, you wouldn't be talking to me right now. So it really took, I think, a lot of courage to do that at that point in time for you. Um, so listen to that. I won't, won't make you retell it, but it's really, really powerful. And then ta- you talked about your near-death experience, too, that and how just life is short, you know, and you had a child at the time and you just had to follow and just do what what you're passionate about and what calls you because life is short. So listen to that. Um, and thanks for sharing that subtitle. What's the current, <laughs> what's the current subtitle? <laughs> so the book is titled choose Yeah. the single most important decision before starting your business. Yeah. The one word that talking about obsessing over titles, the one word that changed at the 11th hour was the word before. Mm. The original subtitle was the single most important decision when starting your business. We realized that it wasn't powerful enough. It didn't underscore how important this is and how you absolutely must do this before you do anything else. And so changing that one word from when to before was one of these things that got me up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night and made me realize we are making a mistake I wrote my editor that night and said, we need to change this. And we did it right before the 11th hour. So um, that's the one word. Very cool. Everyone check out choosethebook.com slash insider. And Ryan, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Jeremy, it's been awesome. Looking forward to catching up soon, my friend. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better.